This is a period that I call the age of ambition for two very specific reasons. One uh, is the ambition, the collective national ambition, to return China to the status that it enjoyed, after all, for most of human history, which was the position of a great power in the world. And then the other is the combined force of 1.4 billion individual aspirations of one kind or another, each of them now potent and distinct and powerful, really, in ways that were, Im that were impossible a generation ago. And if you understand the power of these two kinds of ambitions, I think it helps us understand um, what is driving China to now, in, what is driving China today and the choices that it makes, and then also the source of some of the tensions inside the country and also some of the tensions that we see emerging in China's relationship with other countries. When we talk about where China is today and where it's going, I think it's important to remind ourselves just a bit about the path that it has followed over the course of the last generation. For me, I got the China book 20 years ago. I walked into a class on contemporary Chinese politics and it was an opera that opened up before me. There was, after all, this epic story, you know, the story that began with revolution and civil war. All of this remembered in the span of one century. Revolution and civil war, the rise of this massive protean, in many ways, tragic force of Chairman Mao. And he was uh, followed, of course, by the rise of Deng Xiaoping, or the return of Deng Xiaoping, who led China back out of seclusion, back into the world. And we all remember the events of 1989, the Tiananmen Square demonstrations, when students filled the square, really the, the very citadel of party power in the center of Beijing. And I was interested, I was fascinated by those events, not only because the participants were only a few years older than I was, this was 1994 and this had all happened five years earlier, uh, but also because it was a period, of course, that ended in bloodshed, and we marked that uh, in the spring of uh, 2014, 20, 25 years, but it was also the beginning of something. What you saw very clearly when you watched the events that spring on television was a, a, a population torn between being of the East and being of the West. You saw it very clearly. They had shag haircuts, and they carried boom boxes, and they had, uh, in many cases, I saw placards of uh, Western script that would say, for instance, there would be the words of Patrick Henry that said, give me liberty or give me death. And yet, when it came time for them to deliver their demands, they did it in the traditional style, down on their knees, a petition that they handed to the sort of aging party members in, who were still buttoned up in their Sun Yat-sen suits. And when the students sang, they sang the Internationale, you know, the great Communist Party hymn. And so you saw this place that was trying to negotiate what it meant to be both Chinese and out in the world. And it was the beginning of a much more demanding era when Chinese people were beginning to ask much more of themselves, much more of their country, much more of their own life's possibilities. And it was captured for me best by a student protester who said to a reporter that spring, he said, I don't know exactly what we want, but we want more of it. <laughs> 